Good afternoon. Good afternoon. On behalf of MIT Sloan School of Management, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to today's uh, uh, presentation. In fact, it's a great honor uh, to introduce to you Ron Williams, who's the CEO and chairman of Aetna. Ron is a 1984 alumnus of MIT Sloan from the Sloan Fellows Program. Uh, he has been a really important leader, not only in the business community, but in our own alumni community. He's been very supportive of this school and its students. Uh, and it's really a very special pleasure as well as an honor uh, to welcome Ron back one more time to MIT Sloan uh, to allow him to share some thoughts with you today about innovation and leadership. Uh, as I hope you all know, uh, Ron is a chairman and CEO of one of the world's largest and leading diversified healthcare benefits companies. Under his leadership, Aetna has made a positive impact on healthcare in America, serving as a catalyst in increasing both access and affordability. When Ron took the reins in 2002, Aetna was on the brink of failure as an organization. In 2001, it recorded net losses of $280 million. Uh, under Ron's leadership, uh, there was a renewed focus, and in some respects, a new focus um, on, one, the company's employees and customers, Two, on the way that information technology and fact-based decisions can transform an organization's opportunities. And three, a set of uh, values that might be called back to basics. And I know Ron's going to share with you some perspectives uh, from each of those kinds of approaches today. Uh, those, those approaches have emphatically paid off for Aetna, uh, which posted revenues of $27.6 billion last year. Uh, which is a 35% increase from 2004, just three, uh, this three years earlier. Among his changes, Ron really has committed to using technology to reinvent the field of healthcare. He directed the creation of Aetna's Executive Management Information System, and under his leadership, Aetna became the first national insurer to offer a consumer-directed health plan. In addition, Aetna has led the industry efforts to develop standards for personal health care records, which provides for patients a new way for consumers to be more engaged in the provision and quality of their health care. Some years ago, an MIT Sloan faculty member who was writing a case on Aetna heard from another Aetna employee that upon initiating a new MIS project, Ron was told that he could have the initial specs for this project in five months, and Ron said, I don't think you understand. I want the whole system up and running in five months. Now, what do we have to do to overcome that kind of challenge? Even in the face of continuing business losses, Ron insisted that long-term information-based infrastructure be initiated and be funded, and uh, I think really represents something that our own faculty here have called and would call managing through worse before better. Aetna, under Ron's leadership, did see the worse and has certainly experienced the better. And uh, Ron's leadership is widely regarded as the basis for that. That's why he's been called a turnaround king. Uh, these days, uh, the world needs many turnaround kings, as you know. On a personal note, I'm very grateful to Ron for his leadership in the alumni community. Uh, he's a member of the Alfred P. Sloan Society here. He's also agreed to become a member of our new North American Executive Board. Ron has come to campus many times to address student groups, to address Sloan Fellows, to address alumni groups. Today is really a distinct <coughs> moment among many of Ron's uh, appearances here, um, coming before this particularly broad-based community. Uh, and it's a real honor and, I say, a real great pleasure to be able to introduce to you Ron Williams. Please give Ron a warm welcome. Well, thank you, and I apologize if my voice begins to fade here. I'm one of the occupational hazards of talking all the time. I was noticing how much things have changed, and one of the things I noticed was food in this room. This must be a special group we have here. Um, what I want to uh, do is really uh, give you a little bit of a perspective on my journey and what I have been through in the context of really helping an organization that is well over 150 years old 
an organization that in many respects had lost its way, but fundamentally had the capacity within it to really be re-engineered, retooled, to develop a meaningful strategy in the marketplace and transform itself in a fairly short period of time from literally the worst performing company in the industry to the best performing company in the industry. Um, I also want to stress that uh, you are never done and that uh, this is really an ongoing journey and uh, both Aetna and, and American business and, and global business is at a very important inflection point. And I really in a lot of ways envy many of you who are going to have the opportunities to really go out into the business world as you resume your careers and really help reshape uh, the economy and how the world is working today. And let's see if I get the right, there we go. Um, so I'm going to talk really about uh, how Aetna achieved industry leadership, a little bit about the next horizon, and then conclude really with lesson, lessons learned along the way. And I really want to open it up to uh, questions and answers because I think that's probably one of the most valuable parts of these types of activities. Now, I also am mindful of the composition of the student body here and that a lot of people uh, are from outside the U.S. and aren't, aren't terribly familiar with how the U.S. health system works, and hopefully you haven't had the need to use a lot of health care services here. But the U.S. system is really unlike most other countries in that the vast majority of people get their health care through their employer. And the employer then contracts with health care plans such as Aetna to really arrange for and deliver those services. They pay us a premium every month, and we in turn contract with physicians, doctors, hospitals, and others who are responsible for delivering that care. And there's a set of the things we do in our business model that really negotiate discounts for those employers and really assume, in many respects, responsibility to manage the health status of that population. So our business model has really changed a lot. On this page, there are some statistics about who we are. We're in all 50 states. We have been historically, and for the past five years, principally a U.S.-based company. We are expanding internationally. And interestingly, some of our new clients are, in fact, government health plans in other systems that have government-run health care systems. So the National Health Service in the U.K. would be an example of such a uh, system. Uh, we actually uh, arrange for services through a network of 843,000 healthcare professionals, and we have 37 million unique customers who purchase products, some medical, some dental, some pharmacy, some behavioral health, and we employ uh, about 35,000, well on our way to, th to 36,000 uh, em employees uh, in the organization today. The products we have are a full array of medical, dental, pharmacy, behavioral health, disability, and those are sold on a pure insurance basis, and they're also sold on what we call a self-insured basis, where essentially the, the plan sponsor is responsible for the claim liability, and we handle all of the administrative services for that organization. And one of the areas that we've really focused on is really value-added technology. And if for us, we spent a lot of time developing information systems that really give us an ability to both help the member be able to perform self-service, understand their own health status, and really begin to assume more responsibility for their role in, in being a healthy citizen. And at the same time, use data analytics, information, clinical decision support to help physicians know more about patients by making accessible all the data that we have that the physician normally would not be able to get access to. Now, just to uh, give you a sense of kind of some of the phases the company has been through, we started in, with phase one, which really was um, the phase where we really identified that we felt there were three dimensions of our strategic performance that we would focus on. One is, is strategically, how would we think about our business and what would be some of the important strategic tools we use. The second was operational and the third was really financial. At the beginning, we really applied business segmentation which was understanding who our customers were from the point of view of the plan sponsors and understanding the distinct needs they had and then actually organizing our business around our customers. So we created a business that was designed to serve small employers. We created a business that was designed to serve the largest corporations in America. And we created one that was designed to serve the kind of mid-market. Operationally, there was a very strong focus on getting back to the, to the basics in, in, in the business, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. 
And financially, it was really about how you get from a loss to profitability. And it's interesting that of all the phases you go through, as hard as this one is, it turns out to be easier than the others. Because when the ship is sinking, it's very clear what you do to stay afloat. You start bailing. And then once you reach a level where you're doing well, then it's not quite as clear to every person in the organization what they need to do. The second phase was really refining that segmentation so that within a segment, national accounts, we discovered there were large employers in that segment. We discovered there were others. Then you applied vertical market segmentation, retailers, uh, banks, uh, law firms, really looking at the distinct needs and building products, services, and capabilities, and then perfecting the basics and then achieving industry average margins. Phase three was really becoming a leader in the important new innovations and strategic directions we felt the industry was going in. And actually by this period, we actually have become a leader. And what you see here is phase three reflect what we set out to do, and in our case really reflects what we actually have done as an organization. We're now moving into phases four, five, and six. We have a whole new set of strategies, new set of goals that articulate really where we envision the organization being when we get out into the 2015 uh, time frame. Now, in terms of jumpstarting our uh, journey, I think um, there were a set of things we had to do, and I think one of them turned out to be communicating with the organization to really make the case for change. And any of you who've ever taken a change management class, I cannot underscore the importance of really understanding the importance of managing change. Because the one thing you will do repetitively over and over and over in your career is manage change. And um, understanding how you do that effectively is an extremely important tool and skill set that will serve you very well. So we had to really uh, create mechanisms and tools to uh, facilitate that communication and lay out what our strategy was. We created a, a strategy we called the three eyes, which really was a way of articulating what we were trying to do, which said it was about the information we had. It was about innovation and new products and services, and it was about integrating all this information and uh, data. We also had to create an integrated planning and forecasting model that really significantly enhanced the discipline in the business. This was a business that it took 28 days to close their books for the month. We now close our books in six days. And we close our books in six days with a level of clarity and insight and rigor that was unheard of in 2001. So that was one of the whole processes. And a big part of that was really creating something we call the executive management information system, which was really a tool that created enormous transparency and clarity because all of the, the financial and other key information was in this dashboard that was accessible to all key employees across the company and created one set of truth for the organization. We also had to focus on the importance of changing the uh, cultures. And for that, we created something called the Aetna Way I will talk about. And really, the Aetna Way really was a way of articulating what we wanted the values of the company to be and what we wanted the company to stand for. And we created that really by spending a good deal of time talking with employees, really looking at the traditions of the company, the history of the company, so that it was really a very logical extension of where the company had gone, but really hadn't been articulated and used. And to, uh, this takes you through what the Aetna Way is. Now, the Aetna Way really are the values, and the fundamental notion is that we put the people who use our services at the center of everything we do and that we expect people to live by these core values. Now, last year, inside the organization, I gave 270 talks to employees. Every talk starts with this slide. I never talk to a group of employees without talking about the values. Unless the values are important to me, unless I demonstrate their importance, they will be unimportant. And I tell people, and I tell new executives in our new executive orientation, I will move around the organization and the first thing I will ask is, in your unit, do people talk about the values? And if the answer is no, somebody's going to get a phone call. And I can tell you, interestingly, that's done wonders for the degree to which these values are talked about. Now, it's not only the degree to which they're talked about. It really is a question of how do we behave as an organization. And so it's important that we focus on integrity as a core value, which is fundamental and non-negotiable. Employee engagement is important because the literature is very clear. 
that an engaged workforce is a more satisfied workforce, it's a more motivated workforce, and it's a workforce that unlocks the discretionary energy that makes all the difference in success in a, a service business. Excellence and accountability was important as a value to us because we had historically been a business that really didn't demonstrate excellence and accountability. And what we found was when we didn't demonstrate it, our customers went somewhere else. And we defined what it was behaviorally, and we talked about it, and we really instilled it as a value. And then finally, uh, quality, service, and value was important because healthcare is unique, and people value quality above everything else. Now, interestingly enough, people don't know what quality is, and people often believe that quality means that the doctor's office is open late, that parking is convenient, and the doctor's friendly, even though they have the worst statistical outcomes for their procedures relative to their peers. And so we invest a lot in quality and understand the quality of care that's being delivered as um, part of our core uh, values. Now, um, the next slide I'm going to take you through is to give you a, a sense of how we really measure this as a benchmark to see are we achieving what we do. Every year, we give our employees an employee survey. We um, encourage them to participate in the survey, and we ask them a whole series of questions. The survey has about 70 questions on it. It takes you about 40, 45 minutes to get through. So one of the questions I would ask is, we are a customer service oriented organization. We have about 14,000 of the people who work there are, in fact, customer service call center type personnel. About 20% of the people are, in fact, in fact, clinical personnel, their doctors, their nurses, their pharmacists, their behavioral health specialists, who, who really pr pr perform a variety of clinical services, helping our members get access to health care and educating them about their health conditions. And about 20% are IT professionals who develop software. The question is, what percent do you think would take 45 minutes of their own time to complete the survey to tell us what they think? And the answer is, uh, in the last survey this year, we had 92% who told us. And what you see is we've had fairly sustained and significant participation in the survey. And it is uh, widely understood in the organization that the survey feedback is taken very seriously, that the executive committee of the company spends at a minimum a day going through the data, really understanding what, in fact, the data means, what are the opportunities and challenges that we face, and what do we need to do about it. And you can see also in this slide the metrics associated with two key questions we ask. One is, do you believe your supervisor in your unit not only talks about the values, but behaves consistent with the values of the organization? And these would be what you would think of as top two box scores. Uh, for this, and the answer here is 83%. Now, that's good news. The bad news is it means that 70, 17% say maybe or maybe somewhere, but not in my unit. But I think this is something that we publicize, and I think the important thing is if you look where we started, 48%, less than half, said that they worked in, in a unit where people were behaving consistent with the values. The other metric we track is the degree to which people were proud to work at the company. And when I came to the company, the company's headquartered in Hartford, so there are a lot of people in Hartford who would work at Aetna. And you would be out at events and meet people different places, and you would overhear a conversation in which someone would, would ask somebody who worked at Aetna, and you knew they worked there, well, gee, what do you do? Where do you work? And they would say, <coughs> I work at health care. <laughs> they would not admit they worked at Aetna. <laughs> They would say, I'm in the healthcare industry, I'm in this, I'm in that. They really would not admit, and you would never see anybody wearing an Aetna t-shirt or sweatshirt or <laughs> under no circumstances. And I think this metric of how proud people are to be affiliated with the company is a very important metric. One, we have more work to do, but one that we feel very good about in terms of the contact. The survey is conducted by an external firm, and I can tell you that on every benchmark of every index, we are significantly above average in terms of our performance. Now, we're, we certainly are not resting on our laurels, and we have more work to do. Another important thing that uh, we focus very much on is really developing high-performing leaders. And I think one of the notions is really creating an organization that's a high-performing organization but is a positive culture. 
And one of the th ways I sum it up is that you can have high performance organizations that are fear based, or you can have high performance organizations that are expectation based. And people much prefer to meet expectations rather than demands. And what we've tried to do is create a place that is high performing where we expect a lot of people. People understand it, and they get to choose whether they want to join or not. And, and that there are very regular types of performance feedbacks. For example, we track and measure the fact that every employee in the company has at least two formal performance reviews each year. We expect that there are more, that there are normal discussions about work progress and review, but that we expect and document a minimum of two reviews across the year. We pay an enormous amount of attention to succession planning across the enterprise. And today, every meeting of the executive committee starts with the review of key talent, a review of open key positions in the organization, and a review of who are the best people to fill those positions based on our succession plans, their development needs, as a way to make certain that we are doing a good job of succession planning and shepherding the organization. We also implemented a uh, rigorous core leadership curriculum to d make certain that people had the competencies that we needed. When we implemented our new business model, it's based on a general management model, we actually did a very extensive level of training in what it means to be a general manager. And it was training that the leadership first goes through, helps shape the course, and then participates in along with the other affected uh, executives. And we continue to build on that so that there's a very disciplined and structured leadership um, curriculum. Um, there also is a very clear articulation of what I call the expectations of leaders. And so um, in our organization, if uh, you were to uh, ask someone about a certain situation, they might say, for example, assume positive intent. And that's one of the expectations of leaders. And we tell people that in, in the normal abrasions of everyday living, there are endless opportunities to be offended. And that what we ask everyone to do is to assume positive intent. And we tell them that our experience is if someone's a jerk, you know it by the third or fourth time, and we have ways of dealing with jerks. <laughs> but when someone looks at your new hairstyle and says, interesting hairdo, assume positive intent <laughs> and move on. <laughs> So um, we have, there's a whole set of things that we talk about, deliver bad news early and personally. For example, the way people get in trouble is if, some, if I learn about bad news reflecting one of my direct reports area from someone other than them. And that as an organization, you don't want an organization where people hide bad news or delay the articulation of bad news because you lose reaction time and you lose the transmission of really understanding where you are. So creating a culture that values and really creates an expectation that it is your job affirmatively to deliver bad news early and personally is a fundamental core value and belief in the organization. I joke that I don't know where the good news department is, but it certainly is not my office. So no one ever need fear that I'm going to be upset about more bad news, because that's all I get anyway. <laughs> the um, other thing that, that we do is we periodically have kind of formal opportunities to say to people, you get to choose if you want to be a leader. It comes not only with certain rights and, and privileges, but it comes with enormous responsibility. And so if you want one, you really have to have the other, and let's articulate what we expect of you. And you can say, I want to do it, or I don't want to do it. And it's OK either way. And we have roles that people can assume who really don't want to provide leadership, and they want to be an individual contributor, which is just fine. What we really want is proper fit between you, your circumstances, your aspirations, and the assignment you're on. And so if you are in a circumstance where, for whatever reason, you have to be home at 5 o'clock every day, but you want to join the system conversion team who's working 24-7, that fit's not going to work. Your teammates aren't going to like it. You're not going to be able to do the job. Stay off that team. <laughs> Take an assignment that is a fit for you. Circumstances change, three years, 10 years, whatever, you'll be in a position or maybe have a preference to, to do something different. So proper fit's very important. Now, one of the things that we've done this year is um, we're going to a formal performance appraisal process in which we measure you for you, the results you produce, and then we measure you for the leadership you exhibit. So if you produce great results through poor leadership, guess what? No prize. 
If you have great leadership but no results, guess what? No prize. To win, you have to really produce terrific results and have great leadership. And so this is the first year we're doing this broad base. We did it last year with my direct reports and uh, to really make certain we understood what it felt like and, and what the dialogue would be. And now we're pushing it out throughout the um, entire organization. Uh, just to give you a little bit, um, I think some of this was covered in the introduction, so I won't dwell on it. But I think the, the, the main thing is we've had very good sustained performance. And most importantly, in the external benchmarks and surveys, in 2001, we were number nine. By the way, there were only nine plans rated. So we were the uh, absolute worst uh, in the industry. And I guess that technically should say least admired company in America. Um, and so going to number one uh, by fortune is uh, extremely important and positive for the employees who feel like they made it happen and helped us really transform the uh, organization. Now, I want to talk a little bit about um, shaping the horizon and the challenges that I'll face as a leader in the company. If you look at healthcare expenditures in the US, we're going to spend this year about $2.2 trillion. It's projected by 2017 to go to $4.2 trillion. And that is an enormous amount of money. And the whole question is, how do we improve the quality of care that people receive and yet slow down the underlying rate of increase in health care? Because health care costs increase at a multiple of CPI increases. And it does so for a variety of reasons that I'll talk about. And we believe that there is a huge opportunity to help make health care more accessible, help make health care more affordable, to slow down the rate of increase and improve the quality. And we, we believe that one of the big opportunities is to deploy technology the way we've used technology to transform every other aspect of our society and of American business. In terms of uh, why health care inflation goes up at the pace that it does, well, the first thing is about 27% is really linked to just general inflation. Then we have about 30%, which is health care prices increasing in excess of normal inflation. And that's driven by introduction of higher price technologies. Instead of an x-ray, we give you a PET scan. Uh, and it, if you need a PET scan, that's the, the most important uh, screening device you should have. That's great. If an x-ray would have done just as well because it was a simple fracture, then we're wasting health care resources, which become revenue to someone but become an overall cost to the system. So higher price technologies, the trick is using them appropriately. Providers have tended to consolidate, I think, effectively. And so we find in our negotiations with hospital systems, you'll have one large brand name hospital who can extract a pretty high tariff, which is st strategically figured out how to assemble 12 community hospitals who you really don't need and who really couldn't extract a pretty high tariff out of you. But because you need the brand name, they negotiate as a system, and they get a pretty good deal. And so the leverage in the system is such that the negotiations end up uh, resulting in, in higher price increases. And then about 40-plus uh, percent is really consumer demand. We all read about all the latest technologies, uh, and we all want the latest new whiz-bang, or we want what our neighbor had, whether we need it or not. Uh, one of my physician friends uh, coined a term that in which uh, uh, she said that the number of patients she was seeing who were internet positive had increased substantially. So I said, I've heard of a lot of conditions. I've never heard of internet positive. <laughs> so she said, internet positive is when you, you enter the exam room and the patient has a stack of computer printouts from the internet in which they have diagnosed themselves, <laughs> recommended the cure, have the prescriptions they believe they need, and you spend 20 minutes explaining why that's not what they've got, they don't need any of this stuff, and get out of here. <laughs> uh, and so uh, patients do bring their own expectations. Also, in fairness, there are very significant new medical treatments that are available that are absolutely terrific that people deserve and should get. Uh, there's a whole new form of pharmaceuticals referred to as biologicals. These are medications that are compounded individually for you and where one treatment may be $25,000 and it may be a life-saving uh, medication that, that you, in fact, need. Defensive medicine and, and the whole issue of litigation is a huge expense. 10% of the cost of health care is due either to direct litigation or defensive practice in medicine. 
where the physician has to be prepared to answer the question on the witness stand that says, was there any other test you could have run, no matter how slight the odds that it would have revealed this condition? Was there any other test? And they want to be in a position to say, no, I checked for everything. So in their own defense, they tend to be much more comprehensive and full than they believe is warranted in the context of their clinical judgment. And then needless to say, unhealthy lifestyles is a huge issue. Obesity is really driving a large number of chronic conditions and diseases. We also have a huge issue in the US in which we have 45 million people who are uninsured. Now, they actually get health care services, but they don't have insurance. And hospitals have to treat anyone who shows up at the hospital. But they do not receive health care the way you or I would want people to receive health care. And so there's a huge opportunity to reduce this number. And what we have done is apply basic segmentation techniques to identify who they are and actually develop specific initiatives and programs, and in some instances, businesses designed to reduce this number. For example, most people don't know that over 20% of the uninsured are actual, actually eligible today for Medicaid, which is a government-sponsored program for low-income people. They simply need to sign up, and they would have health insurance. But we don't find them, and we don't sign them up. Turns out about 9.7 are not citizens, and we all think in the US, oh, must be the undocumented population. No, there are people who are not citizens. They're in the US. They don't have health insurance. So we can have mechanisms to help them find ways to get health insurance. College and university students are about 10%. Um, Massachusetts is one of the states that has a hard waiver. If you're in college, you have to have health insurance. Other states don't have that program, so that many of the students don't sign up for health coverage and, 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 and don't get it. So if, if we said to all the states, you had to have a hard waiver, if you're in college or university, you had to have health care, we could reduce the uninsured by about 10%. Um, ultimately, we're left with, um, there are about 9 million who have incomes above 75,000. Not everyone in this category can afford health insurance, but if you're single and you make $120,000, hard to argue you couldn't afford it. And so probably some of this population could, in fact, afford it. We're left with, the, with probably in the 13 to 16 million range where the fundamental question is, people can't afford it, and as a society, we should have, we have to step up to the fact that we're going to make the resources available to give these people access to health care services through vouchers or other mechanisms. Um, I think the, uh, this is a strategy we have as a company, and I think the uh, things I would uh, focus on is we really are about leading the industry, talked about quality, cost-effective, personalized health and related solutions. Leveraging information is a fundamental part of our strategy. And we have had a system architecture that we have been plotting away on for over seven years. And we have really outdistanced our competitors because our architecture has given us the ability to build capabilities they can't emulate easily because most of them operate on multiple system platforms, do not have an integrated architecture, and really have not made the sustained and substantial investments that we have made. Um, I'll talk just about a few of these. Um, at the heart of it is something we call the care engine. The care engine takes all the data that we have about an individual member, and the care engine is populated with the science base. Every article that's published in the New England Journal of Medicine, every set of guidelines developed by the American Cardiology Association is reviewed by a group of physicians and converted into computer algorithms. We then take what we know about you as it occurs real time and feed it through the care engine. And it is amazing the gaps in care we find. We find that you have a condition, a test should have been conducted, no one's conducted it, we notify the physician, they conduct the test. We find that you have a condition that your cardiologist knows about, but you go see the dermatologist and you don't tell them you have the condition, they prescribe a medication that's contraindicated for your condition. It's not a drug-to-drug -drug interaction. It's drug-to-condition, which isn't picked up anywhere in our system. So those are just a few examples. We have a host of other things, the personal health record online. A member can go in and really see their accumulated uh, health, health record, health status. We have a whole host of decision support tools. We won't have time to go in. And then we have something we call our Aetna Clinical Total View, which really is something our nurses and clinicians use to understand what's going on with the member. 
Um, a host of things that we focused on also all center around creating a true healthcare marketplace, recognizing that in our system over time, consumers are going to spend more out of pocket for healthcare than they have historically, and they're going to demand a set of consumer tools, decision support to help them be empowered to make those decisions. The industry doesn't have it, and we've invested a lot in really giving them those tools, which really center around transparency, where you can actually go online, look up a physician, and see what they charge for a service before you go get that service. But then, if it's a really important service, that what the consumer wants to know is the quality of the care and the outcomes. And so transparency really has those two uh, components. Uh, this represents our uh, health care reform uh, position, which I spend a good deal of time on these days. Uh, get, making certain that we uh, get and keep everyone covered, that we really build on the strengths of the employer system. We really focus on reorienting the system toward uh, preventive uh, care and um, uh, the quality of care, and that we use market incentives to really help transform the system. Um, I think lessons are learned. Um, I think it's extremely important that you have values and you articulate those values, and that as leaders in an organization, you understand the values of that organization and that you incorporate those values. And if you don't like the values or they don't have values, my suggestion is go someplace else because it's not going to be a, a good place in my opinion. It's also important to be willing to reinvent yourself. And I think the people here, by virtue of the fact that you're sitting in this auditorium, means that you've evidenced a willingness to do that. My message is don't stop. Keep reinventing yourself. Keep growing. Keep evolving. I think it's also important to embrace diversity of, uh, in, in all forms. My executive team um, is composed of a very diverse group of people. And that's diverse in, in gender, in race, in ethnicity, in, 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 in geographical uh, origin, uh, and in problem solving style, and in functional expertise. You know, some organizations, the, the way to the top is everybody's got to come out of finance. Everybody's got to come out of marketing. What you need is an organization that has balanced functional perspectives. All of you are here to transform yourself in many ways from high performing functionists ultimately into general managers in, in many respects. And what you want at sitting around that table is somebody who understands IT in really deep seated. Everybody should understand it, but there should be a really good functional expert. Same thing for finance, same thing for operations, same things for marketing. So you need a balanced executive team and you really need to value that diversity. And you want to hire people, not in your own image, who make nice younger brothers and sisters, but people who really are tough, aggressive, and hopefully smarter than you are, and better able to contribute. Because ultimately, no one person can lead organizations effectively. It's really about teams. I think it's important to know the difference between leading and uh, managing. Um, and, and, and to recognize that you are never done leading and that you really need to have a personal philosophy of leadership. It's also important to recognize it to share what you know with others and to think about your role in mentoring and developing the talent in the organization. Because wherever you are, there are people a level or two down who are trying to figure out how to get to where you are today. And it's extremely important that you reach out to them and, and share with them what you in fact know. Uh, this is, uh, the next one is, is a mathematical impossibility you will probably have concluded. Nonetheless, I can tell you as a symbol, it is extremely important. When I stand up in front of my 36,000 people and say, my commitment is to work to be at least 15% better each and every year, it basically says to people, I'm not there, I'm not done, I'm not finished, I'm not resting. I'm just as focused on continuing to develop and learn and grow as anyone else in this organization. If I can do it, is there any reason that you can't do it? So it's uh, uh, something that's extremely important. And it's also important to kind of always add value uh, in terms of what you do. That, that The way I think about it, if you're leading a team, the team should be better for your presence. If the team is simply the sum of each part, so one plus one plus one equals three. What value are you adding? Your job is not to do the team's work. It's to help the team be better and to get that whole organization functioning at a higher level. I think the next point is really about eternal vigilance. I mean, you are, you are never done. Uh, I think our business and our society is at an inflection point. And so in our own company, 
we're looking at 09 from an entirely different planning perspective. And we're pausing and saying 08 was an extension of 07, 07 was an extension of 06. We had our strategic framework. And we still have our strategic framework. But the question is, let's examine fundamentally what we need to do differently in today's environment than what we did last year. And so you have to always be prepared to be vigilant and to make certain that, that you are doing that. Uh, that really concludes the uh, prepared remarks. I will open it up to uh, questions. I know I don't have to do with this group, but I have a great technique for our town hall meetings. I tell people at the beginning that uh, I expect questions. There's no such thing as a silly question or, or an inappropriate question. But the thing that really gets them is I tell them that all the seats are numbered, and I will be calling out the numbers if I don't get questions. <laughs> and I can tell you that does wonders for people thinking about what the question is. There's one over here. I'll repeat your question if you just. With, with election, you mentioned it um, and it's sort of a, a pausing point. Um, but what types of preparations are you making on either side um, of the political spectrum? Yeah, I think the, 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 uh, well, what we do first is we view reforming the healthcare system as a nonpartisan issue. I don't meet any person, Democrat, Republican, Green Party, you name the party, who says, more people should not get access to health care. People are for that. The question is, people have different fundamental beliefs about how to do it. And so what we try to do is to educate them about the implications of their preferences. Because this is about trade-offs and choices. And so what we've earned, we think, is a leadership position in which we are sought out and participate with both parties uh, to share our perspective and say, tell us what you want to do, and we'll tell you the implications of it. Because we work in all 50 states. Some states tried something. We have a broad perspective on it, and we want to help get something done. So that's how we really uh, try to approach it. I think one of the realities is, with the economic crisis the way it is, there really is not going to be a lot of new money to do anything, and that's going to be one of the huge challenges. Uh, yes, we'll do this gentleman here, and then we'll work our way up. First of all, thanks for this uh, great speech. Really enjoyed it. Uh, I have a question regarding um, the core values. When you came into the organization, did you have uh, to reinvent the core values? Did you um, change them from what they were before? And if so, who did you include in this discussion? Yeah, the, the answer is the company had values in the archives, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but if you, were to, if, if you were to enter my office, for example, when you get off the elevator, the first thing you see is that value wheel. Uh, if, when I came, there was no value wheel. And so what we did was we actually assembled a cross-section of people from around the organization. And we had work groups who reviewed the historical values of the company. And they made suggestions to what was in the executive committee of the company, who then took their input, and we debated and discussed what the values were. And then we decided the values based on the input of the organization. It was really broad-based, and it was designed to build on the historical legacy of the company, but which where the values really weren't promoted. Uh, she was next, and then we'll come over here. First of all, thank you very much for coming today and speaking to us. Um, within the healthcare system, I know people love to point the blame finger at both pharma and insurance, saying no matter what's going on within the healthcare environment, you consistently rake in very large profits um, while there's still many people who need care, need better care. And I was just wondering what you would say to those. Yeah, it's a great um, question. Things. Thank you. Uh, the, the, the first answer to the question I would start with is if you look at $2.2 trillion, and you look at the total collected profit of the for-profit health, health plan sector, it's $10.5 billion. Now, I actually had a circle built that showed the $2 trillion and showed the $10.5 in proportion to the $2.2 trillion. 
Then I calculated what we save, health plan sponsors, by negotiating rates with hospitals and physicians, what we save in quality and patient safety initiatives, and I think we're convinced it's a very good return. Now, our margin uh, after tax is about 6%. Um, we pay about four points in taxes. And if you, so if you think about what we save the healthcare system, you think about what we pay in taxes, and you think about the fact that we make 6% after, after tax profit, we think it's a very good investment for society. And when we think about the innovations that we've added in helping the system transform itself from an acute system that manages broken legs and trauma to managing people who have diabetes all their life, cardiovascular disease all their life, and by helping them understand how to work with their condition, they can stay out of the hospital and, and save money. We're very comfortable that what we do is a, is a very good service and one we feel very good about. Uh, yes, it's young woman here. We'll do her and then, then we'll go back. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about how you um, develop this really robust set of principles that guide you in leading such a big company, and especially through, through a turnaround, because it seems like you've had a chance to articulate a lot of these principles. Um, and I was just wondering if you could talk about how you generated them, how you developed them. Uh, a, a lot of it, quite honestly, came about as a result of some communication forms that we have. One of the things the company did not do was we did not have a regular meeting of the managers and supervisors in the company. Every quarter, we have what we call the quarterly managers meeting. And it's managers and individual contributors. It's a hookup, 5,000 people. And I take an hour and outline how we did for the quarter, what our, what our successes, what our failures were, what we need to focus on in the next quarter. And so what happens was it turned out to be an excellent crucible to say, you know, what are the fundamental messages that I want to shape and craft and, and, and really instill in the organization? And so, you know, after starting that in 2001, uh, we found first people had no idea the company was losing money. All they knew was their budget in their department. And so the first thing we had to do was educate people on the facts of what was going on. And so what we found was that was a very helpful organizing principle to know that every quarter there was an opportunity to really get in front of that audience and take these messages and really distill them down and then help cascade them out throughout the organization. So there was an expectation that after the quarterly managers meeting, every department got material that they would then work with and cascade throughout their organization. So there's, those were some of the techniques that, that, that we used. And a lot of it is reflecting on what you see and inventing metaphors that resonate. I created one which was space age plastic. And the notion was, I, I'm dating myself, but I had an HP 12C. Imagine if those of you know what an HP 12C is. Um, it's about the size of a, of a cell phone, uh, and it's a solid block of plastic. Well, it's space age plastic. When you heat it up, it's extremely malleable. It'll take any shape. It'll do marvelous things. As it begins to cool, it reasserts its original shape. Now, that metaphor became a metaphor in the organization for reversion to old practices. As people began to feel good times are here, we're out of the woods. And so if anybody said, you know, this is a space age plastic moment here, people kind of got what it is. So there's an opportunity as a leader to really create metaphors that help the organization visualize and share a point of view. This gentleman had a question. I think I've got six minutes before the state. Yes. Uh, first off, thanks for taking the time to come speak to us. I remember that big wheel that showed where the increase in health care costs came from. Wh what do you see as the, ma as the major areas to decrease costs? I hear, I've heard preventative medicine, things like reducing, taking measures to reduce hospital-acquired infections. So, and also, how would you incentivize something like that, like preventative medicine for one, yeah. particularly given a shortage of PCPs yeah. nowadays? I think the, the uh, there are several factors, but the heart of it really is that we get what we pay for. We pay physicians for activity, as opposed to paying physicians to manage the health and, and of a population. And so the more you do, the more you get paid. 
And, um, and so I think what we need is we need a payment system that really aligns what we want the physician to do, which is make certain people get their screenings, they get their preventive exams, they get the patient education, that they get the kind of care that they need when it's needed. And that if you need an x-ray, you get an x-ray. If you need a PET scan, you get a PET scan. And so physician, aligning those incentives are extremely uh, important. I think the other uh, things that we can do is to increase the clinical decision support. All of you have more decision support tools than the average physician has. Think about that. And think about how the science base changes from the time someone finishes medical school 20 years ago, 15 years ago. So one of the things we have to do, what we try to do with this care engine, is to make available everything we know about that patient, correlate it so that the physician can then make their judgment based on all the available data as opposed to based on an incomplete set of data. Uh, those would be a, 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 a few of the things that I think we can do. I think the member has an enormous responsibility that many of the conditions people have are quite treatable and, and prevention. You know, s smoking is not good. I mean, we all know that. Yet, 20-something percent of the population smokes. Obesity is a huge problem. Lack of exercise is a huge problem. And the baby boom generation are going to be the biggest offenders as they begin to age. Uh, do this gentleman here if we can. And then we'll go to the young woman there. Thank you once again for being here, Mr. Williams. Uh, my question is, you, you referenced in your presentation about reinventing yourself uh, constantly. Could you speak to a time, uh, perhaps in your career, where you did that in a, in a large way in the process that you followed to accomplish that? Well, I would, I would say that um, when I came to Sloan, that was in one example of reinvention. Uh, I worked in a controlled data corporation. I had a very successful uh, career there, uh, and I could have kept doing what I was doing. And uh, you know, ultimately, uh, I believe done well there or in, in other companies. But I wanted to really uh, continue to develop and grow and develop what I felt would be a better skill set and a better set of capabilities. And so for me, it was a decision to leave you know a reasonably compensated position in Minnesota and come to Boston for a year to Cambridge and go to school here. It was you know a high risk, and somebody would say, "Well, why on earth would you do that?" Well, the answer was that I felt that I would have better opportunities, better career, and that for me it was an opportunity I felt to transform myself from a high-performing functional specialist into a real general manager and executive. And it, you know, I think the results speak for themselves. There's a question here. Hi, with the increasing pressure for employers to cut costs and higher unemployment rates, how do you propose um, that Aetna or the government helps expand the reach of the employer-based healthcare system? Yeah, I think the, um, uh, there are things that we can do. I think, I think, I think one of those really is to uh, support the, the automation of the system. I think, I think we could really substantially reduce the rate of increase, which would keep more employers in and really help uh, uh, the um, employers enhance affordability. This is, a, this is a place where government, I think, could have a very effective role. In the administrative side, when Medicare required that claims be submitted electronically, all physicians, all hospitals submit claims electronically. If there were requirements for, they just passed some uh, e-prescribing regulations that will incent providers to submit uh, prescriptions electronically. I think the automation of the system is something that the government could really play a fundamental role in. I think there also are some opportunities to create more markets. Uh, insurance is regulated in all 50 states. I literally have, the state of New York has told me to do things one way. The state of Texas has told me to do the exact opposite. And the New York says, if the company's in New York, I don't care that the employee's in Texas. I want it done my way. The state of Texas says, I don't care what New York says. They live in Texas. They're a Texas citizen. I want it done my way. I get them on the phone, and I say, what do you want me to do? And they each say, do what I told you. <laughs> So uh, I, think, I think creating a little bit more rational opportunity for regulation and market would be very helpful. Uh, yes, the last question, and you, you get it. 
The question is, um, I talked about leadership in, in management. Can someone who's not seen as a leader be an effective manager? I think the answer is yes, uh, but I think that ultimately the best managers are great leaders. Because at the end of the day, uh, there's, this is the, you touch a point I didn't cover, and I'll, I'll be brief on this. One of the most important lessons I ever learned is that consideration for the person, the team, the individuals must be greater that consideration for the work. Now, my consideration for the work touches that ceiling. <laughs> and what that means is that my consideration for people had to be higher than that. Because ultimately, the work is done by people. And you cannot lead unless you can get people to follow you and feel that they want to unlock discretionary energy that only they have the ability to influence and control. So I think you can. I just think you can't be as good as if you really. Also, leadership can be learned. People aren't born to be leaders. Thank you.